you and I trust in Jesus Christ, our sins are eradicated. Welcome to this presentation by Hickory Corners Bible Church. It is our desire that you will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and will place all of your hope and trust in Him. Please join us as Pastor Jeff Warden II opens the Bible for us today. It just seems like our schedule tends to get very busy, and it's a good time for us just to settle, to pray and thank God for all these things that are going on, and just to ask Him to continue to guide us. So let's do that now. Our dearest Lord and Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you have provided for us in many different ways, in many different areas. Because you care for us, you have provided for our salvation, you've provided for our life, you've provided everything that we need for life and godliness, your word tells us. We're thankful for the milestones and the memories and the things that are going on in our lives. We just ask that you are at the center of all of these things, that you are at the center of our thoughts, that you take the chief role as we progress in this life, that you are glorified, that we seek to honor you in all these ways. Thank you for this time that we have together. Thank you for your word. Help us to open it and present it well. Take it and apply it to our lives this week. In Jesus' name. <clears throat> One Sunday morning, the pastor noticed little Alex staring up at the large plaque that hung in the foyer of the church. The plaque was covered with names and had American flags mounted on either side of it, similar to what we have in our lobby, right? The seven-year-old had been staring at the plaque for some time, so the pastor walked up, stood beside him, and said quietly, Good morning, Alex. Good morning, Pastor, replied the young man, still focused on the plaque. Pastor, what is this? Alex asked. Well, son, it's a memorial to all the men and women who died in the service. Soberly, they stood together, staring at the large plaque. Little Alex's voice was barely audible when he finally managed to ask, Pastor, which one, the 9 o'clock or the 10.30 service? <laughs> I thought that fit being Memorial Day tomorrow. Uh, it's not a laughing matter that these men and women gave their lives. Please do remember that. Be careful who you wish happy Memorial Day to. There are uh, many in our community have lost friends and family and uh, relatives in the service to our country. Um, just wish them a good remembrance for that day. Previously, we've looked at the fact that Scripture is available to all believers everywhere. God has children all over the world, as different and diverse as can be. They range from very old to very young, very low IQs to very high IQs, formal education and no education at all. Most of them are ordinary people just like us whom the world believes are not part of the intellectual or cultural elite. If God has invited, and He has, and His Spirit enables all of these people to approach Him in prayer, then prayer must be fundamentally simple. It must be possible for every believer to have a meaningful, satisfying prayer life regardless of ability, education, or access to resources. God has not called believers from all areas of the world in every imaginable circumstance, then urged them by the Holy Spirit to enter into communication with Himself if that communication is unavailable or too difficult to accomplish. So as we continue to look at praying Scripture and the promises of Scripture, we come to realize that Scripture leads us to simplicity. Before we open God's Word, I want to ask His blessing on this time together. God, take Your Word now. Help me present it well, that Your Spirit guides it into our hearts, 
and guides it into our lives, that it becomes living and active within us and bears fruit for your glory. Amen. Turn with me to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. We see in this verse the simple formula for faith explained. Faith is built on the word of Christ. So using Scripture for our prayers builds our faith and our prayer life. Prayer is not some complex methods or words that are said in certain ways to yield certain results. Complexity and simplicity are opposed to one another. And our lives have grown increasingly complex. Think about just in this generation. We've gone from excitement from putting a man on the moon to having frequent space shuttle flights, to now living for months on end on the International Space Station. Now there's talk of space tourism, and we recently flew a helicopter on Mars. What an amazing accomplishment and incredible complexity has become. We've gone from a huge box sitting in our living room with a black and white picture screen to the ability to watch videos from all over the worlds on our phones. Our phones have gone from a rotary dial box connected to the wall with a short cable tying us down to a few feet to being accessible anywhere at any time on our cellular devices. Our lives have become so complex that we can hardly handle them. Our children and grandchildren are able to understand and program these computer devices at the same age that I was playing with sticks and mud. In our complexity, it's become difficult for us to approach God in simplicity. We need to return to the Scriptures to simplify our faith and approach God like we did as children. Children are accustomed to asking someone else to meet all of their needs. The greatest someone that they've ever known is God. With our growing into self-reliance comes a sophistication that causes us to lose the need for prayer to have someone else meet our needs. The desire to pray remains, though. The draw towards communion with God is what causes us to release awe and wonder at amazing sunsets, at storms, and incredible sights. We've all been there. We've seen something and just been in awe over that thing. When something elicits that kind of awe-inspired wonder, we understand that it's our desire to communicate with the amazing God who created and put all of those wonders on display. Emergencies or disasters trigger desperate cries for help and deliverance. The simple draw towards prayer is built into our beings. It's undeniable. Even though we inherently are drawn to prayer, these desperate cries and simple prayers are natural. We need instruction to mature these cries into meaningful communication with God. In our complexity, we try too hard to sound mature, sophisticated, and self-reliant. We look to Scripture as God's textbook on prayer, to become disciplined in prayer. E.M. Bounds has said, men prayed in Old Testament times because they were simple men who lived simple lives. 
They were childlike, lived in childlike time, and had childlike faith. The simplicity of their lives made prayer as natural as sowing and reaping as marriage and family. I've had the opportunity to pray with several people in third world countries, and I've been amazed at the natural, vibrant approach to God that these people have compared to some prayers that I've heard here in the United States. I had the opportunity to witness to a man. It's one of my first trips. I had been praying for God to reach out and show me how he wanted me to communicate with these people. I didn't speak their language. I wasn't sure how to approach them. So on one night when we were all gathered together giving testimonies, I saw a man sobbing in the crowd. Of course, the Holy Spirit nudged me and said, go speak to that man. And I nudged back and I said, I can't do that. He's crying. He's trying to hide in the crowd and I can't speak Spanish. The Holy Spirit continued and I said, fine, I'll go talk to him. So I walked through the crowd, tapped him on the shoulder and I said, what's God doing in your heart? He turned around and looked at me and his eyes got this big around. And he left. He ran away. So I thought I'd blown it. All right, God, I thought for sure you told me that I need to go talk to this guy, and now he's gone, and I've ruined this opportunity. So the next day, as we were training, he grabbed a translator and walked up to me. And through the translator, he said, how did you know God was talking to me? I said, well, he was talking to me too. He said to go speak to you about whatever it was he was telling you. And I have a feeling he's working on your heart. We had the opportunity to pray for his salvation that day because he realized that God was speaking to his heart and it was time for him to pray for salvation. That man knelt and prayed on his own with such an amazing knowledge of his sin and who God was and what forgiveness meant that I was blown away. He didn't need coaching. He didn't need leading from us. The Holy Spirit provided all of the words necessary because he was so completely surrendered to God. Nothing else was distracting him. Nothing was drawing his attention away from God. It didn't matter that he was in the middle of a soccer field and all his friends were watching as we knelt and prayed. These people are completely dependent on God and His provision. The problem here is that we tend to look at government or business or families or the church to meet our needs. Our society is never going to tear down the idols of state or church in order to take a step back to more simple times. In fact, we've been studying in Revelation here on Sunday nights that God is going to pour out judgment on both worldwide religion and government because of the idols that they have become. Complexity and simplicity are at war. We have an intense inner desire to be independent and self-sufficient. If we put our minds to it, we can accomplish anything. Has anybody heard that recently or said it to someone else? We can solve any difficulty and we can be satisfied in ourselves. We see those whose heart is darkened to sin on a trek to discover themselves. We look to things and activities to satisfy us rather than God Himself, completely and utterly. We admonish each other to live a little when Scripture says to live is Christ. We find it too easy to pass judgment on past generations and their veneration of idols, but completely miss the fact that there are very real idols in our lives that we worship. This is what Jesus warned his disciples about in Mark chapter 10. Turn there with me. Mark chapter 10. Mark.
Mark 10, starting at verse 23. Oh, it is on the screen. Jesus, looking around, said to his disciples, How hard it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Jesus is not condemning wealth or rich people. Scripture is filled with many examples of godly people who are wealthy and wealthy people who are godly. What Jesus is saying is that people who have things tend to rely on those things. Dependence on wealth and health and prosperity take our eyes off God and His provision. When we look at things instead of God for security, we don't approach God with every aspect of our life. We only come to Him in extreme situations or emergencies. We aren't in constant contact with God on a daily basis, and we aren't comfortable when we are in contact with Him. Our prayer is a fire escape instead of a daily communion. When we look to Scripture as our source of prayer, then Scripture teaches us to pray in a relationship of dependence and obedience. I know that there are stories, even in this group, of God taking away all of the things that we had relied on in order to refocus our attention on Him alone. When God is all we have, God becomes all we need. When God is all we have, our prayer becomes as natural as breathing. A.W. Tozer said the reason why so many of us are still troubled, still seeking, and still making little progress is because they haven't yet come to the end of themselves. We're still trying to give orders and interfering with God's work within us. Jesus uses the example of a child to relay the simple faith, the simple truth about our faith. Look at Matthew while you're there. Turn over to Matthew 18. Matthew chapter 18, verses 2 and 3. And he called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. This truth is as simple as it gets. I see four things that I want to look at more closely involving the implementation of this simplicity. A change of direction, humility, dependency, and a loss of rights. The first thing we need is a change of direction. The first word of the message of the new covenant is repent. Turn over to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, starting at verse 1. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What's interesting is the last word of the Old Covenant says basically the same thing. If you have the New American Standard Bible that we have here, turn three pages backwards to Malachi. Chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4, starting in verse 1.
For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace, and all the arrogant and evil, every evildoer will be chaff. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. You will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. You will tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant. Even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb for all of Israel. Remember there in verse 4, that word means to return to or to make a memorial. It implies that the people had turned away from the law. The Lord is telling them through Malachi, turn back, change your direction, remember the law that I gave you. In Matthew, the word repent means to change one's mind. Literally, it means to think differently. Both words mean there's a change in our direction. When sin entered the world, Adam lost the communion that he previously enjoyed with God. He hid because of his sin. Rather than walking and talking with God, we turn away to our own devices. Man pursues sin. God calls us to turn away from sin. That's the change in our direction. We change our mind about sin. We agree with Him about sin. This change in our thinking changes our direction. We turn to God. We turn away from sin. And God's Word tells us that propitiation has been made already. Sin is Forgiven. We are loved by God and His grace is ready to be poured out on us. We think we need to change ourselves before we approach God, but His Word says the only need for change is our direction. We turn our back on sin. We turn our face to Him. This is what repent means. This is what remember the law means. This is the only change we have to make. We agree with God about sin. We reject sin and turn toward God. He makes all of the other changes that are necessary to be made. He knows much better than I what changes need to be accomplished in my life. This first change of direction when we repent, confess, and come to Jesus as our Lord and Savior is the first step in our travels. Look at Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Some may have memorized this. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's in the imperative. There's not anything else attached to that than our confession and our belief. That's our change of direction that we take initially as sinners. We confess with our mouth, we believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are saved. Scripture makes it so simple. We are the ones who truly try to complicate it. But our journey doesn't end there. That's the first step now in our new journey towards God. As we continue to travel along the route of sanctification, we'll find the need for redirection as well. A change of direction can happen when we take our eyes off 
the ultimate goal and we get caught in the weeds on the side of the road. Pilgrim's Progress. That's an amazing analogy of that travel. Getting caught in the weeds. We need to make a course correction when that happens. Turn over to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. Another good memory verse. 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What's the difference between that and Romans? 1 John was written to believers. Believers also have that need to confess and change their direction. There will be times when we need a course correction on our travels. Every time we change direction away from sin, we find God waiting to forgive us and completely cleanse us. So what stands in the way of us approaching God? In simplicity, often it's our lack of humility. That's our second need. When God appeared to young King Solomon, he said, Ask and I or ask what I shall give to you. Solomon's response shows uh, the level of humility that God truly desires. Turn to 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. Starting at verse 5. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream at night, and God said, Ask what you wish me to give to you. Then Solomon said, Thou hast shown great loving kindness to thy servant David, my father, according as he walked before thee in truth and righteousness and uprightness of heart toward thee, and thou hast reserved for him this great loving kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king in place of my father David. Yet I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or to come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen a great people who cannot be numbered or counted for multitude. So give thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, to discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of thine? And it was pleasing in the sight of the Lord that Solomon had asked these things. When Solomon says, I am but a child, he's not referring to his chronological age. He was married when he was about 18. He became the father of Rehoboam when he was about 19. He became king of Israel when he was 20. Now God is appearing to him as the king, so he is over 20 years old, married, father, king of Israel. When he tells God, I am but a child. And he isn't expressing false humility here either. God can see completely through those issues when we raise them. What Solomon shows is he's viewing the tremendous tasks that have been laid out before him. Judging Israel, sitting in his father King David's place, building the temple, ruling over Israel realizing that he does not feel adequate to do any of it. He's telling God that he's a child. He's unable to meet all of the requirements on his own. James 4.10 tells us, Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and He will exalt you. Solomon takes a position of humility before God 
And God rewards His humility with complete provision of His need. Not only that, but He made complete provision for Israel through Solomon. God promises to meet all of our needs when we depend completely on Him. That's our next point for dependency. Turn to Philippians. This will be our memory verse for the next little bit. Philippians chapter 4. We're going to do verses 6 and 7 and then skip forward to verse 19. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And verse 19 says, And my God shall supply all of your needs according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Scripture makes it clear that every aspect of our life is to be brought before God in prayer and dependence on Him to provide. We are children coming to our Father to meet our every need. God promises not only to supply our needs, but also promises that He has more than we could ever ask or imagine. We will never find Him short of anything that we need. Finding security outside of our relationship with God is very much an American way of thinking. We're told to be self-sufficient from our childhood on. We encourage each other with, you've got this. And we even throw misused Bible quotes. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. That's an actual verse in Philippians, right? Anybody know that? The problem is it's heavy on the I. I can do all things through Christ when we're quoting this in the wrong areas. We attempt to do all things without actually depending on God. We even attribute quotes that aren't biblical at all. God's not going to give you more than you can handle. It doesn't say that anywhere in Scripture. We encourage people to press on in their own strength because God is standing by ready to rescue if we get in too deep. The problem with all of these things is our self-reliance. In Philippians, Paul is describing circumstances that were incredibly difficult to deal with. But his complete dependence was on God. The emphasis wasn't in the I can do all things. It, the emphasis was on the through Christ. Paul's total dependence is on God. Therefore, he's able to do all things. God's knowledge is far superior to ours. His provision is our only source of life. We are to live and function in complete dependence on Him. Our prayer now flowing out of these concepts is pure and simple. We become like children sitting at the dinner table and saying, please pass the potatoes. How much pleading is necessary? to get the potatoes passed to your plate. Sometimes at our house, we play around and pass them the wrong way. But they eventually get there. The provision is already made ahead of time and planned out, completed when the potatoes are placed on the table. Our asking is merely making our desire for the provision to be passed to our place. We recognize our dependence on God and ask Him to pass His provision to us. We've said before, God will not force Himself, His will, or His provision 
on us. When we acknowledge our dependency through humility in prayer, God promises to richly provide. Finally, we recognize the fallacy of those who demand that God provide what they seek. We realize our position as children means that we have no rights. Loss of rights is our fourth point. Children do not have the same rights as adults. They live within the rights that are conferred upon them by their parents. Christ exemplified this in His complete submission to God the Father. Turn to Philippians again, chapter 2. Philippians 2, verses 5-8. through eight. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although He existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied Himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus, being equal with God, chose to become obedient to the plan and the will of God to provide salvation for us. He prayed constantly, not my will, but thine be done. We are called to this same attitude, recognizing our position as children and submitting completely to God and His plan and His will for us. This may include doing things that we don't necessarily think we want to do. Doing God's will always yields better results than what we think we should be doing. We give up our rights to choose and submit to God. He provides the desires of our heart, the will and the way to complete what He calls us to do, and then He promises that He will reward us for doing those things. Still in Philippians chapter 2, look at verses 13 and 15. For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing that you may prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. Our prayers must flow out of these concepts. The more we use Scripture in our time of prayer, the greater the depth of humility we will find. Our conscious dependency on our loving Father to care and provide for us increases as we pray. Approaching God with childlike dependence shapes our hearts and our minds to be more like Christ. I had gotten to this point in the message and thought it was a good place to wrap it up, and God said, nope. So sorry for those who thought they were getting out early. I realized that the word providence came up several times in what I had written down and studied. And it feels like it's a good place to take a side trail. I want to look a little bit closer at the providence that God has revealed to us in Scripture in order to grow our faith and to approach God with this childlike dependency. We already understand that God is sovereign. What does that mean? That means that He has the ability and the power to accomplish anything that He wants. His will and His power are right 
and just, and He is sovereign in all that He does. When we speak of God's providence, we see that His sovereignty has purpose. Look at Isaiah with me, chapter 46. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 10. My purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. And we've already looked at Philippians 4.19. It promises, My God shall supply all your needs according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. The word providence is built from two parts. Pro means forward or on behalf of. Vide or vide in Latin means to see. So forward or on behalf of and to see. When it's combined, it would seem like the definition of providence would be foresee. Or to see forward, but it doesn't. It means to supply what is needed or to give sustenance and support. So how did providence come to mean supply rather than foresee? We have an English idiom that's based on a biblical story that actually explains that meaning. The idiom says, I'll see to it. It means more than the words actually signify here. When we say, I'll see to it, what we're saying is, I'll take care of it. I'll provide for it. I'll see to it that it happens. When we speak of God's providence, it means more than foresight. It means God will see to it that things happen in a certain way. In His way. This is based on a story from Genesis. Yes, we're going all the way back. Genesis chapter 22. Turn with me. Isn't it amazing how much of the Bible is tied to Genesis? Genesis chapter 2, starting at verse 7. Pick up the story of Abraham and Isaac. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. In verse 14, it also says, Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide. As it said unto this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. Whenever that word provide is used in this chapter, it's the Hebrew phrase to see. In simple terms, Abraham said to Isaac, God will see Himself the Lamb. You hear that? God will see Himself the Lamb. It began all the way back in Genesis. In verse 14, the Lord will see and the Lord will and it shall be seen. The King James Version, we get the name of God from the transliteration of the Hebrew phrase changing the Lord sees into Jehovah Jireh. One of the names of God. Newer translation, including the New King James, have replaced see with provide. So we move on to the question, what does God seeing have to do with His providing? The simple answer is that God does not simply see 
as a passive bystander. He's never only an observer. He's always doing in relation to what he's seeing. God doesn't just see something. He sees to it. God's observation of our lives is never passive. He's always at work purposefully doing. His vision is tied to His provision. According to the Heidelberg Catechism, the Almighty, everywhere present power of God, that's His sovereignty, whereby, as it were, by His hand, He still upholds heaven and earth with all the creatures and so governs them that herbs and grass, rain and drought, fruitful and barren years, meat and drink, health and sickness, riches and poverty. Indeed, all things come not by chance, but by His fatherly hand. This is where we come in simplicity. To the place where we can rest in God and His care and providence for us. Scripture has made it clear that we come to God in prayer, not pleading to Him to fix, to change, or to care about something. He's already seen it, and He's already provided for it. We come to prayer then looking for God's perspective for ourselves. We ask for God's will to be done, His kingdom to come, and His purpose to be accomplished in the things that are presented to us as circumstances on a timeline. We confess that we can only see along the timeline, but Almighty God has already viewed the beginning from the end before any of it came to be. And He approved of it. As we are changed, our prayer changes also. We no longer come to God and plead to heal this illness or remove this tumor or change this circumstance. We pray instead for God's will to be done in this illness. Provide the power Your Word has promised for me to endure in Christ in the midst of this illness for Your glory. This means if this illness goes away, I praise God for that provision. It also means if the illness continues, I praise God for that provision because He will be with me in it. If God blesses me with health or possession or wealth, it's not for my comfort. It's for me to use for His glory. Simple prayer based on Scripture says, not my will, but Yours be done. For Your glory, I ask You to provide as You see fit for Your servant to be used in this circumstance, whatever it is, this illness, this cancer, this continuing problem, even to the point that my life is forfeited, I humbly offer myself to You, God, to do as You see fit. Because I trust You. I believe You are good. I believe You are righteous. And You are just in all of Your ways. Holy God, be glorified in me and through me. Knowing God through His Word has brought us to this simple place of surrender in humility. We surrender our rights. We submit to God and His will in total dependence on His providence. Let's pray. Dearest Lord and Heavenly Father, I am so thankful that You have provided everything that we need for life, for godliness, for endurance. 
Guide us now, God, through your Spirit to bring you glory in whatever we are involved. In any circumstances, be glorified because we stand up and say, God is my Father and I trust that his providence is all I need. In your name I ask these things. Amen. This has been a free presentation by Hickory Corners Bible Church. If this ministry has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting us through hickorycornersbible.org slash give. Hickory Corners Bible Church reserves all copyright protection under applicable law and in accordance with our Christian Copyright Licensing International streaming license. For more information about us or to connect with us, please reach out through our Hickory Corners Bible Church Sermons YouTube channel, our Hickory Corners Bible Church Facebook page, or our hickorycornersbible.org website. Our pastors are also available to talk weekdays from 9 to 4 Eastern at 269-671-4505. We hope you will join us next time as we continue helping ordinary people passionately follow Christ.